start in a couple of minutes. Hi, friends. Hello to people in their own Zelda waves. Hi, Zelda. You have a very good wave? Um, an eager wave. Hello to, to friends here in the audience at the Kelly Writers House and many people out there watching us through a live stream. Um, greetings. Welcome then virtually to the Writers House. I'm Al. I'm really, really excited because it's Erica Kaufman Day. And what does that mean? It has meant, it has meant a triple header of activity. A Modpo live webcast, which we did in this room. And I just wanted to shout out to Jack Gieskin, who is here from, well, let's just say from Kentucky, is here and has been just a great interlocutor all day. And then we did a poem talk with, along with the aforementioned Jack, um, and we had such a, such, a, such a good time. And this is the third of the triple header, so we're really happy. The format will be a brief introduction by me, a reading by Erica Kaufman from, it sounds like some prose poems. Very excited about these. Um, and at some point, Erica will say, okay, I'm done with the prose poems, and then I will have a question that I wanna ask Erica and at the same time, prompt those who are watching virtually, and also those in the room, because the people in the room, you, you, you know, you get, I guess, first choice, since we can see you raise your hand. I'm going to ask a big, giant question. Erica already knows what it is, about Erica's work in convergent fields. And at the same time, ask the webca webcast, or the live stream audience, which is watching us through YouTube, to use the YouTube chat to talk, well, throughout the whole reading, but in response to my question, whereupon Lily Applebaum, Lily Applebaum right there, yeah, Lily, where is Zelda with the wave? I'm, I'm missing Zelda's wave. Zelda, come in and wave. There it is. Um, Lily Applebaum will be looking out for your comments or questions. And then Lily, who has her own mic will convey those questions. So we'll have a few minutes of that. And then at that point, we will say bye to the many um, live stream uh, watchers. And those of us who are here at the writer's house um, will adjourn to the, uh, to the garden where we have a tent set up and lights, and we'll have a reception out there, okay? So here we go. I have actually written something, it's short. I've actually written something. It's, I've admired Erica's poetry for a long time. And although we have two books for sale here, Instant Classic and Post Classic, we're kind of hoping that the third book will be a prequel. That would be called what? Davy? Instant Proto Classic, Pre Classic, I don't know. Anyway, Erica Kaufman has done remarkable work. Um, I've been a huge fan of her poetry since Sensory Impulse. You remember we talked a lot about that book. A chapbook, I guess you could call that, right? And I'm obliged to her for the work that she has done to create the Teacher Resource Center in Modpo, which is a place where teachers can access for free all the resources that they might need to teach this supposedly difficult poetry uh, that they and their students encounter in the course. So let us say you don't know the, the poetry of Erica Kaufman. I think that might be true of some of the Modpo people who are watching on the live stream. You know Erica as a respondent to poetry, as a critic, and you've heard her talk about teaching. But if you didn't know the poetry, where would you start? I'm gonna suggest that this is the place to start, instant classic. In this book, 
Erica turns to John Milton's Paradise Lost as a source, source work, as a model, as an, and as an anti-model. Instant classic isn't just a phrase applied to, as Erica prompts us, a new movie that is certain to be a blockbuster. Um, it's also not just a term that some men have used to describe a portrait of a woman in which she looks especially striking, an instant classic, as Erica also teaches us. The writer of this book, and maybe we should say this is true of all her writing, and all her work as a pedagogical radical reformer, begins with the realization and the premise that, to quote Erica in this book, quote, there was never a place for me in the garden, think about Milton, meaning Milton's garden, of course, meaning the originary place where Eve finds herself, the main two questions that Erica Kaufman asks are these, not just here in this book, although this is a place you can find it, and not just in the poetry overall, but in her teaching and her mentoring and her teaching teachers. And these are the two questions. First, who owns language? Second, is language a body to liberate? And the speaker of the poems of this book, each poem called Instant Classic, not to make it too confusing to refer to them, is ready to, and that, that speaker is ready to encounter how things really are. Another thing I really admire about Erica Kaufman as a temperament, encounter things as they really are with all of the radicality that you can bring to a situation and yet facing reality. I didn't say pragmatic, I said reality. To quote Erica, I admit not being afraid of my semi-object state. Wow. And adds, quote, my first swimming lessons were from an amputee. In this narrative, she writes, I market myself as generally happy. I do think so, generally happy. Is that phrase ironic in the book, generally happy? Possibly. But then again, I know the poet personally, the poet who wrote instant classic and post classic and sensory impulse. And I thus know her also as the innovative director of Bard's Institute for Writing and Thinking, a grand title, the Institute for Writing and Thinking. You only have a few topics there where she has become one of the people in this country most effective at connecting on one hand what we admire in the difficult, this difficult poetry that we read, and on the other hand, how non-traditional classrooms can become sites for the co-creation or co-authorship of learning. I so admire what Erica Kaufman is doing to make sure that the convergence between poetics and pedagogy produces actual results. So, Finally, back to instant classic once more. The final section's epigraph is a quote from Gertrude Stein's verbal portrait of Picasso. Let me recite what history teaches. History teaches. Is that not a perfect phrase or couple of sentences for Erica Kaufman? Erica teaches us that Stein is saying that the only alternative to history's self-affirmations and recited exclusions is the frank and actually quite satisfying realization that, quote, there never was a place for me in the garden. Or as she quotes Maurice Blanchot from his book, The Writing of the Disaster, let the disaster speak in you. That's Erica Kaufman, someone I very much admiring, admire for accepting the fact of the disaster and seeking to speak, almost bespeak it in her. Erica Kaufman, back at the writer's house for the nth time. I don't know how many times she'll tell us in a second. Please put your hands together for Erica here in the room and wherever you are. Erica Kaufman, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Al. Um, this is one of my favorite places in the world, and a lot of that has to do with the care and attention that Al brings to the world of poetry, and I just 
I always feel very lucky to have um, to have worked with you now for quite a long time. And thank you so much. I'm really glad to be here. And thank you to the people who are watching and those of you who made it in person. Um, so I'm going to do a couple of things in my reading. I haven't read in a while, and um, so I'm a little bit nervous, so I'm just going to say that out loud. But I think I'm going to read a little bit from Instant Classic, and then I'm going to read from the sequel to Instant Classic, which came out right before the pandemic. And what I'll read from, from the second book, will include a longer prose piece, and then I'll end with some poems that are kind of newer, um, that are from hopefully the final volume in this trilogy that I've been working on for a long time now. So um, I'm just going to get going. And as Al said, Instant Classic is my attempt to grapple with Milton in a range of different ways. Instant Classic, help me, I'm regressing. There's another version of this story, where I am a man, my concerns, a Bible, where I luxuriate in authority despite water, aesthetics, and I say, it doesn't always have to be this hard, and believe it. In this story, my rib cages bungled, my hush voice irrelevant, because I can repeat the word, any word, any, into public light interrupting the dogs that train me, conceal, hard, I rant not to impress, not to cope, not to echo locate, face the reinvention committee, the prospect of bronzed bodies, easy, Vitruvian, etched, proportionate, one foot in each crow, recursive as shit. In this story, the real center, my navel, the human body depends on more than just the position of fins, legs a part of the voice. We only deepen over time, find a viable pastime in anthropometrics, a way to optimize my skull products, occipital, prospectus, mine a signal origin, single. In this story, I do have a fingerprint. It matters. So let's hang the used condom on a branch of an olive tree. Let's ask one last question at the end of each chapter and read Float Alone and Singing, my skeleton into this new legal setting where tear gas reminds us of the carefree days of simple constitution worship. In this story, I wear the same face as the serpent, flushed with genuine potential, or the desire to return the womb to my own version of Isaac, ramrod genital sprouting from insistence. In this story, I show compassion for the man outside the logic of alter state, where a garden makes sense, where equine resembles angelic speech, my documentary hypothesis, one paragraph repression. In this story, we don't care about my hero's sorrow nature, her apology editable, a portion of scripture where animals make sense as substitutes for what is voice, the same type of narrative platform, guild, of the perfect, legally, merely inspired. In this story, we're all humiliated on his mountain. We're all a defining movement that bears no filial import. Machetes and the detail save us. Teleologic locker room perpendiculars recreate the romantic today. Predator done. Instant classic, regenesis. I would like the apple to talk to us, to encourage the feminization of this surveillance, state-imposed pathway, to active verbs. You force repeat as in the epic cycle of remediation, a word that translates toxic state, toxic. I bear fruit, it's rotten. My idea, vacation, some project, a view, in my exile, realize my identity, always a problem. My lineage, street cred, proportional. My history develops to fit the face, the tumor, steroid, chemo, cancer, goiter, dis-ease, genetic narrative, straight. Dance party, petri, dance, horseshoe kidney, fever sprite. 
Remove a part of my body, stitch me, switch my blood type to anesthetic, pierce my nipples and wake to reject the metal, expel, neuropathetic, a littoral accounting of every time I change myself to be someone else. Put it on cakewalk, genocide dreams, where the snake no more a symbol than the pallor I see when I sleep just the right amount of disheveled, alongside my character. She represses longing, regresses back into the suitcase sermon compendium. Coda for, I'm always in pose in public state, always preoccupied, compensate for photography. In this parking garage of illegal places, I'm used to life and trauma, to posturing caregiver, caretaker, but I don't know how to take care to increase parallelism, to get myself out of the conservatory and into the well, where I can be the enamored tourist embracing berate me as unilateral carnage fail. Promissory wrote, I'm not over, mountain, aloof, hoax, maelstrom, object, listen, misread, complaint, compliant. Listen when I tell you parade is key. Our place is under the highway, where we wear our surface, reissue ballot measures, foreclose on the participatory gleam of pink slips, decisive ledge, trademark contingent laborer tax monkey, ugly mantra desultory death toll tout extreme proof. I was born in this vocabulary of basketball sleeves, wrist brackets, morphine pagodas, two happy meals, and the woman I see every morning in secrecy, in dictum, in perfume. Initially feel like tangent, initially lopsided in the vest of indulgence. Initially private, my vision of sibling rivalry. Initially peak housed, a precipice mount for radiological panic. It's not a funeral I see, out instead instances, fainting, a plethora of mornings where my bed and MRI my archangel say nothing, and the camel eats of every tree. So I let the wicked touch me, let nakedness become a chore, let wearing a form of uniform become a way to bray witness. Instant classic, moderately Baroque, and the first line of this poem comes from the book After Such Knowledge by Eva Hoffman. In the beginning was the war. In the beginning, not an epigraph or disclaimer. Detect traces of fabric, trailers unruly, a way to own my own ancestry. In the beginning, I let the ducks go by. Repeat the word disenchantment. In the beginning, we were at war. We were all just ordinary, form intent on assimilating, a way to collate questions like, please, why apologize? Why rehabilitate entitlement? A reference point for naming with conviction. My cousins are always among us, a revenue target set by the hatches that never open. In the beginning, I didn't understand, robust in my abandonment, what it means to be in a family, both inside and outside the double digit pastoral gate. If you blush at autonomy, you'll always blush, in practical, in practice, the promotion of we are not finished, only a precursor to law, a professionalizing of robotic companionship, phantom kitty utterances, white light experience of the activist kind. Technically, silence is a state of being forgotten. Absence is the articulation of sand on the edge of the garden scrawl. In the beginning, I noticed the sound of every sound, the changing of locks, a blessing instead of poltergeist. Rice under control, the way I give my playthings room to survive. What's not in paper wall hanging narration of mouse pad antics, clear assertive scripture, can't savior you. In the beginning, I wear a ukulele, name my tendinitis ancient site, trim my bangs, build an assessment of what we do with our bodies without dramatizing or formal terms like, 
I should have been a cowboy, or... Let's rewrite plaques for a reason. Let's take up all the space left on our communal forearm maker bot bust. Because I talk myself into take myself into the traditional dove trope, I rationalize as manifestation of my need for messengers and rodents, pacifism and heaps of garbage, rats' nests of awesome Congress, contact, designate, a parallel Cinderella, useful in her treatment of the verb overcompensate, nightfall fertility. I don't have any hobbies outside of scarring, subtitle labels with epigraphs of my grime, of my let's take on. The cricket playhouse, the pantine enigma, drawbridge party, wig stack. I spend too much on staff inflections, metered worry, look in the mirror, see the word overwhelm, Remember, you were once a person without bronchitis, once a body outside of the rainbow flag, and the scab didn't define me. Once I know Sunday, I don't rest. Regret, sweat, come out with sports caps, plastic dogs, say, when will the epic end? Realize, infirmary a bridge, a way into refrain, unknowing refusal, to face the face of our garden, all we care about, is clothes. And this book ends with this poem. Instant classic on contingence. At this point, I don't care about elevators or conversation. A shopping bag brings, the mark on my arm finally heals, ceases to be constant. Activity transitions to rote implied liability. Deliver my subset. At this point, I happen or not, fill ambience with acts, recopy obvious chemistry table deals, vowels overbearing. At this point, I decide to assign bullets. I want to disembody him. It's topical, like, what's keeping you up at night? Or, thank you, I hope that felt safe. Big business briefcasings underscore man's original what about me mantra. It's crescendo cell space faux staccato. Turn apple to mango, then giraffe, then why? Am I not surprised by bombings or circumcision? At this point, my interest in sand, dry heat, nosebleeds, man-made needles. At this point, the buzz, a chainsaw, my window. I'm connected to glass more than oxygen, body mass more than hormones, positive, pressure monger, tank, respirational. Is it wrong to just want to feel literal, safe? Toxic parts and toxins. My body needs vacuum, carrot, caraway, leeks, loincloth, trouser dance. I don't mean to be indecent or exotic. I'm a man who fashions flesh as more suitable than produce. Potency has become mark of defense. I'm too old to hide inside this genie's bottle of common anemia post-punk shag. There's no record of what we did without visit. I'm climbing some stupid mountain emeritus. I tell him I could live here. So when I began to write Instant Classic, I immediately realized that I was doing something big. I was very interested in the way epics are built, um, particularly our canonical classic epics, and um, why those texts might need interventions. And um, so Post Classic, which is the the second book in the series um, works with Gilgamesh and Homer. And I'm going to read the note that comes at the very end of this book. And then I'll read a bit from the book. Because um, I, think, I think it's just helpful to get a sense of how my thinking is going from book to book. So it's called, this piece is called Retranslation Note. Paradise Regained, John Milton's brief epic and sequel to Paradise Lost, arguably revolves around the relationship between heroism and obedience. That poem begins, I who err while the happy garden sung by one man's disobedience lost, now sing recovered paradise to all mankind, by one man's firm obedience fully tried. 
This is a very different vision of man from the start of Paradise Lost, which is of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree. If it is disobedience in the form of Eve's agency that leads to the fall, however debatably fortunate, then is obedience a hallmark of post-lapsarian time? Post-classic began with this question of obedience in mind. It struck me that neither the Odyssey nor Gilgamesh are obedient texts, and their disobedience is grounded in female agency. Odysseus's wife, Penelope, subverts any typical marriage plot by spending her nights unraveling the shroud she weaves by day. She refuses suitors, insisting they wait until she completes the project she never intends to finish. In Gilgamesh, we meet two immortal, independent working women, Shamhat, the sacred prostitute, and Shaduri, the tavern keeper. Shamhat's magic is what moves the plot of Gilgamesh forward. She domesticates Enkidu, civilizes the wild man, and introduces him to Gilgamesh. Shamhat makes it possible for man to become man. Similarly, Shaduri speaks to a broken Gilgamesh honestly. You will never find the eternal life that you seek. This assertion is demonstrative of how Shaduri refuses to entertain Gilgamesh's fear of death and frenzied mourning. King or no king, it is Shaduri who knows the best way for a man to live. Instant Classic aimed to investigate how a body becomes both censored and commodified, taking its cue from the publication history of Paradise Lost. When I began Post Classic in the summer of 2013, my idea was to create a sequel to Instant Classic that worked through the earliest epics, with the central experiment being to see how a contemporary monomyth might function, full of conflicting translations, queerness and querying, and a commitment to subverting the way bodies read as female are expected to journey. As with Instant Classic, I began by creating word lists out of the books that called to the project. A range of translations of the Odyssey and Gilgamesh, lesbian pulp fiction classics, and poetic and theoretical texts. My writing process is often procedural. I create word lists, decide on a specific form a poem will take, map out the way I hope to engage with the narrative arc of the canonical epic, and then I get started. So the poems are meant to be both mine and not mine. I work with words on an individual level, but I don't actually generate the words myself. I'm interested in the idea that language speaks differently when its normative use is disrupted, i.e. sitting down to write versus working through a predetermined set of language. However, after finishing a draft of Post Classic in the spring of 2016, I found myself unwilling to put the work into the world. In the throes of the 2016 presidential campaign, I noticed my relationship to how I used language changing, fueled by a sense of urgency. In the fall of 2016, following a series of particularly egregious campaign speeches by Donald Trump, full of racist, sexist, homophobic, ableist rhetoric, reminiscent of Nazism, I decided that post-classic needed to be entirely redone. The epic needed to come out of me and my own subject position. The hostility and unreliability of Trump's campaign rhetoric led me to believe that the current moment was not one in which I was comfortable sharing authorship or depending on other sources. Stephen Mitchell introduces his approach to translating Gilgamesh as motivated by a desire to, quote, find a genuine voice for the poem, to recreate the ancient epic as a contemporary poem in the parallel universe of the English language. Mitchell's approach to translating a text that exists in fragments, a narrative full of holes, is to acknowledge that to translate is to contemporize, to revision a text. In an interview with Library Journal, Writer-translator Daniel Mendelssohn discusses the myriad of translations of Homer's Odyssey in existence. Quote, Homer's Greek famously has many aspects. It's archaic, but also moves swiftly. It has nobility of tone, but isn't stiff. It is highly stylized and formal, but never seems artificial. And a great truth of Homer, trans Homer translations is that each translation tends to get one or two, but rarely all, of these facets. 
In her translator's note, Emily Wilson writes, quote, all modern translations of ancient texts exist in a time, a place, and a language that are entirely alien from those of the original. Homer is and is not our contemporary. Reading these reflections on the act of translation led me to decide that I would need to retranslate post-classic. I thought of the initial draft of the poem as its own kind of translation, an intervention into the worlds depicted in, the Gil in Gilgamesh and the Odyssey. So my job then became deciding how to retranslate the text back into my own language, on and in my own terms, through a process that would involve active voice intervening on the text's content more than a homophonic or sound-based translation. Given that I'd begun the book several years earlier and given the results of the presidential election in 2016, I wanted to think about the potential of retranslation as another kind of world making. In Homer's art, Alice Notley refers to the Odyssey and the Iliad as, quote, public stories, stories for men about a male world. Anne Waldman describes her own epic impulse as, quote, I needed as 20th war ravaged century inhabitant woman to take on male energy. With Notley and Waldman echoing in my mind, I decided to approach my poem line by line to shift its vocabulary from procedurally generated to subjectively organic. I wanted to try to revision the epic as story as it might be contemporarily told. And I wanted to be accountable for the way I compose. I wanted to be disobedient because disobedience is generative, originary, and central to any creation myth. I'm going to skip a little bit. Suppose when I use the word epic, it becomes a narrative that's contemporary. Suppose there is no garden to begin with, to fall from, to weed. Instead, a place where disobedience is desired and desirable. Alternative fact constitutes sin in this space. Suppose a post-classic where post indicates a relationship to information, and classic signifies the familiar yet outstanding, the time-tested recipient of one's gaze. So I'm going to just read around from different parts of this book. An invocation. Sing to me emotionless exercise. Tweet the essence of how I hear you say circumferential, birthplace, infrastructure, subway, dogma. Say, I hear you verbatim, so sing to me of intermissions and water. Mark my name a logo, pregnant with handshakes. Sing to me of material troops, of fortified islands. Harbor me eccentric. I can't wait to walk all these grounds, fuck all these cannons, their song alone stork, an act of trying to use ballet as frame to dramatize certain collisions, open, wary, monumental battery. Sing to me of mandates and public cruises, corporate contest, high character, sample brass militant floor plan. In another war, go by the tower. I like to think I grew up on the ferry, a history sold off deliberatively. Dance the dance of evacuation party, of anyone else's torso, not a head, not a snake, not a woodpecker, not another story of residue and revelation, of chameleons, their gavels. Sing to me, O oh, competitive pitch, O oh, instrument dissident, super horn desire. Generally, nothing is neutral, so choreograph and leave me, food truck professional drag, interchangeable with muzzle. Sing to me, O oh, presuppositional gloss, a non-public preview warehouse to house the roles to play, to get used, to sharing tourist injury, life jacket adages, a big ass umbrella. Sing to me, O oh, institutional hashtag chasm demolition accommodation guarding guards. Sing to me, O oh, forms of reservoir, of retrospective fragility statistics symbolic. I dreamed last night there was this weasel. I never use beauty for revenue. Dear E, it's easy to tell a good story. 
It's easy to imagine beginnings, endings, and always the judgment of Eve. It's easy to see oneself as narrator. It's easy to proclaim something without question. What does it mean to open one's eyes, to see another man attack another man, injuries involve blood suddenly because, remember, this is dramatic. A first vision of death, the killing of one's brother, how does one see after that? To be responsible, exhausting, to be labeled historical figure, a visible articulation of confusion, of outcomes so real and heartless and, it's exhausting to find yet another, wild man, a woman, tablet, monstrous, who can count this reverie of bullfrogs and cockroaches born covered in fur, parents not proud, sheep part ape, a larger mythology, rationale for prostitution. I don't claim to take space in any feminist camp governance journey pronounced. Post-classic. Don't worry. You'll realize it's monotheism that causes all the problems. It's the expletives of mainstream parchment, marriage between blood, agriculture, and the key to the armoire already constitutes informed consent. The strategy du jour for functioning outlet cells. Think of elbowing as code for morality, a mass in my neck, another indicator of the benign neglect too profound to be bitter too neurotic in the face of regular experience, a common test for the intangible exodus, or the devouring that takes place when no one knows the difference between TV preachers and the fanatic's empathy, fully planned, prepared to play, hopeful, to grab the snake by the entrails and offer up a macro view of creation. Post-classic. If I say we have postcards to send, if I say please worship pages, tattoos of our beliefs, order season, order commerce, welcome, interpretation, general, fashion statement, active knowledge. If I say I was born statuesque only in my demeanor, who promises everyone who promises to repent, historical sequence continues to hurt and hurt. And it's not easy to deal scientifically with feelings. Individual limbs and parts of the body, the crocodile still life among us, present day archeology, span parts of the body, no shame, our word for everyone who promised, a city is thus always. Possible, always community, cheated, creditor methods, breaking methods, inert. Remember, a story is just another kind of constraint I wanna travel through. Pleasure in use is just a sign of just creation. And yet I don't want to cultivate the plan, give advice through law. I'm no different inside our condition, romper-friendly jukebox brogue. It can be said, harm is easy to see. If I fall in love with my own anagram, admit to being confused when I feel like a painting full of bodies holy scale, we're desperate, I want mastery, laser tag, a feeling of being accountable for every assumption, even rodents accomplish. If I say guilt is one of the biggest flaws of our civilization, because we always have both feet on some battlefield, analog like robots who vote for all the wrong voices, deliberate in deliverance, goat-framed photographer of unruly bodies, unruly because I don't align referential, because I wear my anatomy like a dance card. If I exercise daily, my lipstick prerogative. If I come to terms with a prefix like free, If I pretend to understand how to label my body and all its gender resent, play off fever. If my hands were just a tiny bit bigger, I would palm a basketball and grow a few more streets. Dear E, where is the basic question? Some of each suspect now amplified. It's hard to isolate my objectives, hang them on a dress form informed by proximity. If I can take a hunk of styrofoam and cloak it in my clothes, then pretend to name her hallmark of heterosexuality. I lack the proficiency to be real in my reading of images and high tops. I feel slayed by emotion more often than my gut permits me admit. What I need to believe is that I won't die gay and alone in the woods covered in ticks. (laughs) 
Post Classic, and this one is for Anselm Berrigan. This is a man-made pond populated by tadpole imports to support a need to be visibly expensive. Overlook who's frog-like expansive. We grow up to be we who cling to threadbare steel lattice. I rely here on memory instead of imagination because no one believes desire in sudden necessity of waiting on a walk across tick-laden fields. Step gently in inevitable mud. It isn't insects who betray me, who sing of infancy in statue form. This one example of many landmarks marked precisely for data, a physical birdcage marmot governing cropsy, even the wayback machine deems scarlet the robin who approach. I don't stand outside anymore, can't stand all flowers in frequent display trope of visible breathing, memeable, yet again the question of money, of exertion, of stripling storied historical stell, ordinary habit model, of it isn't landmark to call millipedes fancy. And I'm going to just read two more from this one. Post classic. After the descent, I stitched together blood type in favor of showmanship a cappella, multifaceted in our conversion narrative, driven by tablets and injury, and various drugs dug up to replace boundless anatomy, aimed to earn rumor shrouded in shipwreck temptation, historically iron more powerful than prophecy, and other currency excessive. I become transfused by how enthusiasm wears the weight of detail, how meaningful is defined randomly, a substitute for authentic connection, rather a bandage, parasitic, lab coat, lap dog, sterile, lyric, epistolary, gestational play, de facto rehabilitation clan, stranger. I ask after the defense commercial, after ants gather to assert behavioral vice in flip chart desert process. Let's not boast or bench service plot neuroplasticity equipment commission. I say sustain me, enabling matrices, inventive. Most mornings, a tree is just a tree. Dear E, let's talk about processes, rely on stories of contradiction by way of stacking images. But how do we understand the name increasingly fallen like you are wonderful or self-evident democracy? Let's talk about empathy self-exiled. It's how I try to find meaning this week, how I respond where appropriation causes harm. Random intention has intention, perhaps designed, to document historiography, one of many relationships to listen to then listen back, emotionless like commemorative culture, like any exercise of man building man long after. The event untenable, a signature riff on memorialization or public feeling. Let's talk about a sequence of geography, push back on losing yourself in lineage, in regime change, real estate class, variegated to omit what happens at every cemetery. Let's say I'm not out there alone, climbing some stupid mountain, happy to pop off and practice facility and damage. Let's say this is victory, this is war, this is protest fatigue, a brief gestural eulogy for appropriate moments, for in-depth tourism, danger zone connectivity. Let's mingle with monument, counter constructivism, say, in the trenches, my temporary mode of mourning, my sensitized education needs no friends. And I'm gonna finish with two short ones. Then these are, I think, part of the next thing. Night hamster. I don't pay attention to hope anymore. Horse becomes landmark only, statement of catchphrases stolen. The ladies know I don't sleep much, resist causality. I'm cold in front of the fire. Occupy, gesture, documentation, asynchronous, couch, meaning, in pharmacies, totes rigidified, like the museum on Judenstrasse, full of what look like ancient clothes. I'm really aware of how identity shudders, as if line dancing through omniscient points of view. I want to know how to say you can't blame homophobia on natural disasters. So instead, panic on Flatbush, realize we're all increasingly fallen, impose questions, dead leaves. 
this coterie. And this last poem is for another friend of the writer's house, Ariel Resnikoff. And I think that it's called Paraclassic. Begin this year split between behavioral finance and biblical story. Hint of altruism, anxiety in the context of text. To begin beyond a place where people die. It rains without emphasis, light bulb, inside location of audience of poor of person, a caterpillar first digests itself, then turns to adult structures, a puzzle to hold boring theory and other feelings, like the rush of not jumping simply from train to train. Begin with frustration and empty chairs, a variety show conglomerate of the kind that seeks competence, not talent, broken axioms in place of an eyeball. Here is distance, then faith, then exile appears, a tree metaphor. So listen, please. I'm no longer preoccupied. Hijack the model who sits to argue shadows. Active pipelines get proximate to my own history. The chemistry behind how we become archaic. A melancholy sailor, a pedestrian mall overwhelmed by concrete. All small things wield importance purely to create new codes, resilient and vibrant. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. That was fabulous. So I have a question I want to ask you, um, and I hope that it's a question, a generative question. And Lily has been, I, I sneaked a look at the YouTube thing going on, and there's a lot of people, and they're very talky. So I want, I want to make sure that the folks who are uh, watching on YouTube hear this question hear Erica's response, and then we'll open it up to the people there and the people in the room to see if we can go from there. Eileen Miles, who adores your poetry, wrote a, an amazing statement about this book. And I'm going to read it and ask you to respond in a, a kind of angular sort of way. Because what Eileen says about your poetry, it strikes me is exactly what you're trying to introduce into the poetry classrooms of America or of anywhere. This is a tall order because there are structures in place to prevent the classroom from being like this. So my question for you is, how do we get Eileen's vision of this poetry, which is, I think she, uh, sorry, they describe it as both antic, kind, slapstick, all over the place, basically, multivocal, multitonal. You have been working hard to take that vision of your own and others' attitude toward poetry and um, reforming education and teaching classroom teaching along that model. So I guess I'm not asking how you do that, because that's a whole other conversation but how you think about the relationship between this kind of poetics and pedagogy and how it, the two can be in conversation and how you can be a poet pedagogue, both. So you know where I'm going with this and I'll just read Eileen's amazing comment and then I'll ask you to respond and those of you who are in the room and also watching can respond as well. And there's some nods here because I think we're all thinking about how we do this. This is what Eileen writes. How her work can fragment, bump, fall away, pile on, and still exude an aura of warmth and kindness and slapstick good times sound, good times sound, is an alchemical mystery that makes, not, not a um, phrase that uh, grad schools of education <laughs> are using a lot, <laughs> alchemical mystery, that makes postmodern poetry and Erica Kaufman's art beating in it be the game in town always worth watching. How does a teacher be the game in town always worth watching? <laughs> Erica, will you respond to that? And then Lily, who has a mic, will go from there and we'll, we'll, I'll use my mic for anybody in the audience who wants to say something in response to what you say. 
Was that a crazy question? No, it's it's a definitely a, a hard question. Thank you, Al. Um, you know, I'll, I'll say that much of how I write and think about both writing and teaching is heavily influenced by Eileen's work. So I want to just start by acknowledging that. And I think that one of the things that I think most about as somebody who spend, you know, I spend my time really thinking about two things. I think about teaching, particularly using writing to teach, and I think about poems. Um, and poetry in the context of education is something that's often marginalized, it's not taught, there's thought to be a right or wrong way to approach it. So I think that the way that I think about teaching is intentionally meant to be the opposite. So instead of presenting a one-sided view of poetry, my aim is to give students a whole lot of space to fall in love with things. And um, you know, falling in love means that you might just love the sound of the words, but you don't know what they mean. And I think that's a completely valid way into poetry. Um, I also think that, um, you know, work that, and I don't know that I necessarily succeed at doing this, but I think that work that takes risks and is, you know, all over the place as far as diction is something that I hope my students feel invited to experiment with in the context of a classroom. You know, in, in the work that I do, I encounter many teachers who feel as though they just can't teach poetry because they don't know how themselves, they don't understand what poetry is, and I actually feel like poetry is a space of incredible potential, and um, our learned attitude towards it is what gets in the way. And I think the same could be said of how we approach classroom teaching in some contexts. I want to be careful about generalizing when it comes to that. Isn't it the case that poets, sorry, that poets themselves turn to the classroom and wind up losing all the stuff that they, all the work that they do in the poems and the work that they do with their students. And it, how do you persuade a poet to be the poet in the classroom without thinking, oh my gosh, I'm not doing coverage, I'm not doing the survey, I'm not accomplishing things? That is a major problem. And, I, and, 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 and Bard has a long tradition, uh, going back to Joan Retallick, a long tradition of trying to push artists to go into the classroom and be artists rather than teachers. And there's some nods in the audience. So I want to hear your response, and then I'm going to give up the microphone, and then Lily can take us from there. Mm -hmm. Am I barking no, that, up the wrong that's, tree? That's, that's another really good question, and I think it's a hard one because a lot of it depends on context. So I want to, you know, I understand that I speak, you know, when I think about my own classroom, and I don't know if my students are watching, but they might be. Um, so, you know, I, I teach in a place of privilege where I'm teaching college, um, and I'm teaching creative writing. So, you know, that's a very, very different thing from teaching in a public high school or even in a public state college. Um, but in the context of my own classroom, I learn huge amounts from the things my students say. And it actually feeds my writing, whether or not the writing makes it out of the notebook because I'm spending too much time prepping is a whole other thing. Um, I think that you know some of the concerns that you mentioned around content and coverage are incredibly real concerns, particularly in secondary schools. And my, my friend and colleague, Emily Abendroth, is here, and she's been doing some terrific work around exactly this question. So I think it's a matter of looking at the learning goals one has for the classroom. So if you want to teach a student how to think critically and be able to write an analytical essay, why not use a poem? Because, you know, there, it's, it's a small enough unit of language. Like if you're working with a sonnet, you can do so much with so little space. So then it becomes, you know, it really becomes a question of like, where are you prioritizing and what are the constraints of your home institution? Let's turn to Davey and then Lily, what are you two doing? I have a follow-up question that's about different kinds of refusal. Mm -hmm. And to do the like medium length version, it's basically 
something that I've wondered about your work. It it's occurred to me that I've now been I started I encountered your work in a journal when I was eighteen. And that was very close to half my life ago. So I've been reading your work pretty much half my life. Longer than I didn't know anything about poems. I was just like, this is exciting. I want to hang out with this. And something that I've wondered about your work for now, 14 years, is about how you think about different kinds of refusal. So a kind of turning away in your work from learned habits of language because they are entrenched in structures of power and in structures of... uh, collapsing the intelligence of students, of making students feel like they're doing things wrong in a space where they're, uh, where they could be excited and are encouraged not to be, but also a form of refusing normative structures of power, a refusal of normative structures of language and normative structures of power that in the like archive of experimental poetry don't always go together. There are folks uh, refusing normative structures of language in a way that's really inattentive to their relationships to systems of power. And lots of work in fields that you're thinking with, I think about queer theory this way, of not understanding all refusals as being equal, of different people's refusals identifying the systems of power that they're refusing differently, and of different people and ways of being in the world and subject positions being more and less visible by the means, by the system of power that is being refused. And so thinking about these two different kinds of refusal that are happening, a kind of structural critique of racialized gendered control systems and a kind of formal critique of the lang- of normalized language in which those are sometimes the same thing and sometimes different things. How do you think about the different ways that you're engaging with refusal in your work? That's a that's another really great, challenging question. Um, you know, I think it's different with each book. Um, with post classic, because that one is a little closer to me because it's it's more recent. Um, that's a book where I I um, I took a one day workshop with the poet Mi Young Mi Kim, um, who we recorded a poem talk about and. I learned so much from Young Mi Kim, and one of the things that she said in that workshop um, was something about how poetry is is a way to use language so that you can make change happen linguistically, um, and that's that's something I thought a tremendous amount in the kinds of refusals that happen in that book, um, because that book took me. Um, You know, it took me almost a decade to write, partially because when it was done, I went back and rewrote the whole thing. Um, And so there there were a lot of levels of things that I was actively trying to figure out how to ethically refuse. And by refuse in that book, I think it's like not only not participate, but also offer alternatives. Um, So I think, I don't know, if I'm fully answering that, but but that's, you know, I think a lot about form um, on a single word level, like everything, you know, everything I work on, you know, there's a reason for everything that happens on the page, not that not all poets do that, but it's, I'm, I'm sort of obsessive in that way, so I, it takes me a long time to write. Um, so there's, you know, there there's always, um, several levels of refusal so there's like a syntactic or like a grammatical thing that I'm thinking about there's certain words that recur and then there there's language from systems um, where I'm trying to kind of reclaim and then therefore change power structures by kind of rehabilitating language so to speak yeah thank you uh, okay, Erica, you're getting so much love in the oh. YouTube chat. In fact, one person said they were falling in love with you, so maybe follow up on that. I don't know. Um, I, <laughs> um, a lot of great places we could start, but one question from Maddie Ophelia. Um, I'd like to know whether Erica sees any trends in the pedagogy of poetry that she thinks are counterproductive and what or how could, could – what – or how could they be made better? I, 
I don't know if it's a trend per se, but I think that there are certain things that are thought to be teachable. And I tend to go in the absolute opposite direction. Um, I also feel like it's important to teach everything. Um, so I always think very carefully about making sure that I'm sharing as many radically different kinds of approaches to poetry as possible. Um, you know, I, I think that there's a certain canon that because of things like state standards um, in K through 12 schools, there are certain poems that, that have to be taught. Um, so, you know, like obviously, personally, I think that's a problem, but I understand that teachers can't do anything about that and they need to teach that stuff. Um, so, you know, I think that there are ways to supplement what one is forced to do. But that, that's a really, that's an interesting question. I also think that um, there's a lot of siloing poetry into either creative writing or into classes for students who are going to study literature, where I think poetry is useful in any discipline. Um, so that's another thing that I think is incredibly important. I was going to wait for dinner, but I'll ask now. Thank you. That was gorgeous. Um, I was wondering more about, I wanted to hear more about the other version and what was the pro, was the method of that? I, like, you gave us this amazing summary of it, and I was like, but what was it like? Was it line by line? Was it four? Like, I want to hear, I, yeah. And so, whatever length version, but please keep talking about it more later and yeah. forever. <laughs> So I, I don't talk about my process much. I kind of purposely tend to avoid it, but I've been trying to get myself to articulate it lately. Um, so Instant Classic was written from a word bank that I collected for years. And um, what that means is that I would just take individual words that I found in books. I would often pick particular books that I thought of as channels um, and think about you know, what does it mean to write through a certain set of language? Um, so for post-classic, I did something very similar. So, you know, I, I have, I call them raw materials, but I, you know, I think I had like a 60-page document of raw materials that I collected from what I decided would be my source texts. And um, I never, I never recycle or I never work with more than a, let's say, the at the most, I'll use a two-word unit um, from someplace else, but I, I usually work with individual words. So, like, you know, I, I was looking at all kinds of, like, there's this crazy book called the Dyke, Dog, Dyke Diagnostic Manual. That's, you know what I'm talking about. So there's a ton of, there's a lot from there. Um, and, you know, just, like, weird um, kind of pulp novels. Um, and then also a lot from psychoanalytic theory. And what I would do would be I would work by by the story I was trying to tell. So I had this thing of raw materials that were words that I didn't generate. And then I had a big wall in my home office with post-it notes outlining the arc um, of Gilgamesh and of Homer and like how the hero travels and that kind of stuff. And then I would sort of match the words to the story, my version of the story. And then I, I you know, it took me very, it took me an incredibly long time to rewrite it because I'm so accustomed to generating poems out of found language that it, it was incredibly hard to translate it back into my own language. Um, and so that that's often what my, like that's that's usually what my practice is. So it's it's somewhere, you know, for the folks who do Modpo, it's somewhere like I think I probably fall somewhere in between weeks eight and nine. Like I'm I'm pretty indebted to poets in both weeks, but um I also think a lot about narrative and storytelling, so that would then send me back to the New York school. Um but I'm I'm very kind of procedural. So, Erica, what you just talked about actually perfectly addresses a question Sophia Nas had, um, which was, what are some techniques you use to inhabit or usurp received language? 
So she asked that before she even knew you were going to cover that topic, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, I, a few different people resonated with what you said about giving students a whole lot of space to fall in love with things. And I guess I would just ask if you would elaborate on, like, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, I'm thinking about the class that I'm teaching right now. So I always run the risk of assigning way too much reading. Um, But, you know, like, we'll be, we're doing a class on sonnets in a few weeks. So, you know, we're going to read a lot of sonnets ranging from Claude McKay to Terence Hayes to Wa Wen. Um, so, you know, I, I'm i okay with sacrificing some of the, you know, being able to close read every poem in an effort to assign enough different things that there are models that students can then turn to. Um, you know, like I, I, I'm constantly questioning, like, what is this poem doing that no other poem is doing um, that makes me want to share it? So, like, that's that's a little bit, like, a, you know, the course I'm teaching right now, we, we read so much, um, and a lot of it is really dense, um, but it's important because I think that it's it's an intro level course, so I think that a lot of, there's just so much good work out there that people don't necessarily know exists. So that's also always part of what I'm thinking is like how to how to introduce folks to a range of different entry points and access points. Because, um, you know, I don't know what anyone else is going to like. I know what I like. So the best I can do is give some examples. Thank you, Shakti. Hello? Yeah. OK. Um, Thanks again for reading. It's, a, it's such a treat to see you read live and in person. Um, in Instant Classic, I think it was, you, the speaker mentioned something about desiring the literal. And I'm curious about what you think about the literal, being literal, and as it relates to narrative and um, your poetic practice. I love the literal, Um, and I think it's super fun to play with the literal. Um, So, like, I'm thinking a lot about, um, like, I read a ton of nonfiction, and not to say that nonfiction is literal, but I think that it's a certain representation of realism or of one subject's, you know, lived position or lived experience. So, you know, I often begin with something very literal in my head and then go through a process of translation so that it becomes less literal because I think that what feels literal to me is not gonna be literal to anyone else. And so, you know, it's it's this kind of tension that I'm always interested in working through that, that has a lot to do with, with, you know, all the different bodies in the world and how we all interact with language differently. No, I'm going to say a no and redirect towards Erica because I feel, uh, and I'm what I'm curious about is if the third one yet has a title, if and if it's revealable, like instant classic, post classic. If there is anything you would tell us about the like arc of where the third one is going, it's actually my question. Um. Yeah. Um. I would. Yeah. I'm gonna do something a little sneaky first though and I'm gonna highly recommend Emily Abendroth's writing Um, and teaching too Emily and I teach together and she's an incredible teacher of many things Um, I think the new book will be either pre-classic para-classic or proto-classic and I don't know which 
Um, and right now there are poems with all of those titles. And so I think I need to learn a bit more about um, my relationship to each of those words um, before I'll decide on what it is. And my, the epic I've been working with is the Aeneid which is a real weird one. That's great. Okay, I, oh, I don't have a mic. I have two quick final questions, and then we're going to put our hands together to thank you again, and then we're going to go out into the garden under the tent. Not the people watching on YouTube. You go out to your own garden under your own tent, and we're going to have a little reception so we can hang out with Erica for a while. Okay, two questions. Finale questions. First, would you tell us in all sincerity, heartfelt, open-heartedness, five poetic influence, personal influences on you? Eileen Miles. Number one. Joan Ritalik. Two. Ann Waldman. Three. We could have guessed those. Um, Myung Mi Kim is Four. a big one. And... I would have to say Audre Lorde. Fantastic. OK. And then the sixth one would be, maybe this is Erica from half a decade ago, or maybe a full decade ago, because you, when we first met, you really admired some of the strategies of the New York School poets. So which New York School poets, poet would you make number six? Alice Notley. Alice Notley. OK, thank you. OK, finally, I wonder if you would reread the last stanza of instant classic on contingents, which reminds me of Mo why Miles thinks you're so great. First of all, the speaker <laughs> speaker in this stanza is seems to be partly male, so it is a, just a rollicking stanza. And would you read that kind of as a finale and thank you in advance? Yeah. I would also just quickly say I was on the job market when I was working on the end of this book, so. Okay. You could get, you can hear it. Yeah. <laughs> Toxic parts and toxins. My body needs vacuum, carrot, caraway, leeks, loincloth, trouser dance. I don't mean to be indecent or exotic. I am a man who fashions flesh as more suitable than produce. Potencies become mark of defense. I'm too old to hide inside this genie's bottle of common anemia post-punk shag. There's no record of what we did without visit. I'm climbing some stupid mountain emeritus. I tell him I could live here. Erica Kaufman, everybody. Thank you. Yay, Erica. It's Erica Kaufman Day. Thank you so much. Thanks. Please join us in the garden. Thank you all for tuning in on, on YouTube. Take care. Have a good night or wherever you are. Good morning, wherever you are. Thank you. <laughs>